for the hiatus, I was actually uh, in Italy last month um, on vacation, but I am back now, I'm here to make more videos for you. And uh, I really appreciate all of the positive feedback that you guys left on my first video. I'm really glad that you guys enjoyed it. So I hope that you find this one as interesting as the last one. Today I'm going to talk about something called cultural relativism. And I like to tackle some misconceptions around what it means to be a cultural relativist and also talk about some ethical and moral issues that anthropologists face out in the field. Cultural relativism is usually attributed to Franz Boas, who is kind of considered the founder of American anthropology. The principle in brief is basically that everything a person does needs to be understood relative to enculturation, that traditions, practices, and beliefs all need to be understood in context, that they're culturally specific. So the thought is, or at least was, that anthropologists need to show tolerance to the groups of people that they're researching, even if some of the traditions and, and rituals and things practiced by those people might violate uh, the anthropologist's understanding of how things should be. It's about not projecting your own cultural experience onto a group of people that you're studying. And it's even more about just avoiding ethnocentrism in general. Cultural relativism comes out of a tradition of trying to remain completely objective when out in the field. And that's something that anthropologists now sort of realize is, is not entirely possible. But cultural relativism is still a really important tool. In 1889, Boas published an article called On Alternating Sounds, in which he called out scientists for being ethnocentric. At the time, a lot of linguists were observing that speakers of some Native American languages were pronouncing the same word with completely different sounds, indiscriminately. These linguists concluded that the languages were somehow more primitive than their own, that they lacked organization. But Boaz noted that the variant pronunciations were not an effect of lack of organization of sound patterns, but that these languages simply organized sounds differently from English. The Native Americans, using different sounds for the same word, simply didn't distinguish between those sounds, but they actually have nuances in their languages that people who speak English can't distinguish between. And the problem was that the linguists were transcribing and interpreting these Native American languages in their own native languages, in French and German and English. So this was a problem, and when Boaz realized what was going on, he basically made the first sort of recorded case for cultural relativism in the American anthropological tradition. So to reiterate, cultural relativism is the idea that all practices and traditions and everything that makes a culture what it is, is learned through enculturation. And that when you're looking at the world, you're going to see everything through the lens of your own culture. So when you're being a cultural relativist, you're basically just being aware of that. You're being aware that you have these biases and you should try to leave them behind and try to look at things from the other, from another perspective. Recognize that when people are doing something differently from you, it's essentially how they were raised. It's not to be confused with moral relativism. The idea that no standpoint is privileged over any other. That there's no absolute morality. No such thing as right or wrong. This can get pretty murky when it comes to issues of human rights. The idea that there are no absolute morals is pretty different from the idea that there's no absolute way of expressing a culture. So it's one thing to recognize that a group of people does something differently from you, that they eat different foods from you or dress differently from you, just have sort of different religious beliefs. But what happens when you're an anthropologist out in the field and you find a group of people that is doing something morally objectionable, something that you think is violent, something that you really just can't wrap your head around. What do you do? Do you remain neutral? Do you look for ways to justify it? Or do you try to put an end to it? What are the limits of cultural relativism in anthropology, in practice? Most anthropologists are not staunch moral relativists, and they're kind of redefining cultural relativism. Because societies are more complicated than being these bounded cultural units. 
they're actually part of a much larger global society, a society where there might be such a thing as right and wrong. And anthropologists might have to apply morals, might have to make judgments. I'm going to talk about some situations now where anthropologists have had to make some kind of controversial decisions and navigate some sort of ethically confusing territory. Before I continue, in the next segment, I'm going to be discussing some topics relating to sex and violence, so please use your discretion. I'm going to start with a heavily debated human rights issue, female genital cutting, more commonly called female genital mutilation, sometimes called female circumcision. And it's a practice that's popularly deemed a human rights violation. The UN has campaigned against it, the World Health Organization has campaigned against it. It's still practiced extensively in parts of Africa and the Middle East. In fact, um, just last year in 2014, a study was published showing that 81% of Egyptian female teenagers are still undergoing the procedure. And many anthropologists, while still trying to understand the reasons why this happened, um, have, have really decided to campaign against it. But it's really important to note their approaches and their reasons for being against it. They, they're not quite what you think. The media often portrays female genital cutting as something done to women against their will. This is true in some communities, but it's a widespread practice and many women actually voluntarily and joyfully partake in the ritual. In many East African communities, it's actually elderly women who seem to be the most influential in keeping the tradition alive, not men. And just to be clear, I don't wanna downplay the fact that this does happen to women against their will and that a lot of women from certain communities really want to put an end to this within their own communities. It's definitely a problem. It's just not the case for every single community or at least not the same case. In some African communities, such as the Kono people of Sierra Leone, people believe that bodies are born androgynous and that female bodies contain male and female parts. For a woman, the part of the genitalia that are male need to be removed in order for them to become a fully formed woman. It's a very important part of growing up. It's a rite of passage. What female genital cutting is, though, according to a lot of anthropologists, is a global health issue. Women don't have access to antibiotics after the rituals. The cutting is associated with increased risk for disease, miscarriage. In countries where the ritual is outlawed, it just means it's not performed in clinics or in a sterile environment. And it still happens, just less safely. So within each community that practices these rituals, the pressures are different, the actual rituals are different, the surgical procedures are different. So it's really important for anthropologists to work in individual communities to assess what's going on without alienating the people that they're trying to help. An anthropologist called Bettina Shell Duncan explained in a recent interview with The Atlantic that people understand the costs. The people undergoing these procedures get that it's dangerous. It's just that within their communities, they think the benefits outweigh the health risks. And within their communities, female genital cutting is really important to social status, and parents want to ensure a good future for their children. But it doesn't make sense in a globalized setting. So anthropologists are becoming activists, and they're using cultural relativism as a tool. You can use cultural relativism to sort of put a practice in context, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't try to put an end to that practice. It just means you have to be reflexive about it. Being reflexive means to take account of yourself and the effect that you might be having on your own research. Another anthropologist who is no stranger to controversy is Nancy Shepard Hughes, and you may have heard of her. She was actually involved in an investigation that ultimately led to a number of arrests by the FBI in 2009, arrests of people who were involved in organ trafficking. Ten years earlier, in 1999, Shepard Hughes and some of her colleagues founded an organization called Organs Watch, which basically tracked and researched and monitored the organs trade all around the world. For a very long time, Nancy Shepard Hughes has conducted an ongoing, multi-sided, ethnographic, and medical human rights-oriented study 
of the global traffic in humans for their organs to serve the needs and desires of international transplant patients. These studies focus on communities living at the peripheries or margins of the state. People in slums, favelas, shanty towns, and impoverished communities who are willfully selling their organs out of necessity for money in South Africa, in Brazil, in India, in Iran, all over the world. She's actually come under a lot of criticism from the anthropological community for her views and approaches to organs trafficking and for her proposition and pioneering of something called militant anthropology. Militant anthropology is basically a form of social justice anthropology, and it's basically against cultural relativism. Shepard Hughes says it's pre-cultural. A lot of anthropologists think that it's not quite ethical to take such a militant stance. Shepard Hughes disagrees. She thinks that taking a militant stance is the only way to be ethical. She, she's really taken the stance that an end should be put to this. Not just unregulated organ trade, regulated organ trade as well. Other anthropologists think that this is sort of bad anthropology and that there are actually arguments in favor of selling their organs, that there are other ways to sort of help people in these communities without completely ending the organs trade. They think it's impractical. But Shepard Hughes really stands by her methods and she has a right to. She's been working with these people directly for a very long time. So, there's heavy debate in anthropology about when to intervene, how to intervene, whether anthropologists are being objective enough, whether anthropologists can be objective at all. But the American Anthropological Association actually has a human rights committee, and they've published guidelines for reporting human rights abuses when out in the field. Because anthropological research involves extended interaction with people at the grassroots level, Anthropologists are in a unique position to lend knowledge and expertise to international debates about human rights, even if understandings of human rights vary by culture. The American Anthropological Association recognizes a human right to express culture, and they recognize that there are institutions, corporations, governments, people who are limiting the abilities of other people to express their culture. And yeah, it's, it's kind of an intentionally vague definition of human rights, but it doesn't mean that anthropologists shouldn't be involved in human rights. So, do anthropologists have a responsibility to be activists? When we're out in the field and we experience things like child prostitution and slavery and infanticide and ritual killings, are we supposed to do something to put an end to them? Or do we just stand back and try to preserve these cultures before they're gone? Cultural relativism equips us with the tools to understand why people do the things they do. But does it mean we shouldn't interfere? Does it mean that they're okay? What do you think?